SpaceX's ambitious plans for 2019 and 2020, Falcon 9 revised prices, Starlink failure aid, concerns grow about space debris, NASA successfully tests Orion abort system and no aliens on the closest 1300 stars. My name is Strange and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. There are loads of news topics, so let's dive right in. SpaceX's ambitious plans for 2019 and 2020. There are many names for SpaceX out there. From biggest failure ever to glory of humanity, they've been called all sorts of names. One thing you'll never hear me say though is that they're slow in what they're doing. Most of us will be familiar with the term Elon time. It refers to Elon's notorious behavior of stating overly ambitious timelines that often can't be met. He did that with Tesla, he did it with SpaceX, and he did it with most of his other endeavors as well. This time though, the news comes from a different source. At 2019's Asia-Pacific Satellite Conference, SpaceX Vice President of Commercial Sales Jonathan Hoffeler underlined the fact once more that SpaceX is not willing to wait one second to conquer LEO and beyond. Amongst all kinds of information, Hoffler gave updated insights into SpaceX's schedule for Starship. Hard facts from officials are rare when it comes to Starship and everything that it's connected to. You know how long we've been waiting for a solid hop in Boca Chica, don't you? And trust me, I'm with you on that one. If what Hoffler said is correct though, the party hasn't even started yet. Hoffler said that SpaceX is planning several test flights into orbit to prove Starship's reliability to customers already waiting in line as stated in last Monday's episode. These test flights, he said, will take place partly this year. He also said that the goal would be to get orbital as quickly as possible. Now here it comes. He said possibly this year. Orbiting means Starship circling the Earth. It does not mean some sort of dipping over the common line. To be called orbital, the spacecraft must go around Earth in an orbit. This would not mean full stack though, I got news on that too. Hoffler said that the current schedule states that a full stack of Starship and Super Heavy is supposed to be operational by the end of next year. If SpaceX pulls that off, it would be a record-breaking speed of developing such a huge rocket. So many things are new when it comes to Starship. The whole concept of fully reusable changes so many details on a traditional design that Starship and Super Heavy cannot be called traditional anymore. On top of that, here comes the next news from Hoffler. SpaceX is planning to lower the price tag on Falcon 9. At the moment, a customer waiting to launch a precious payload into orbit at the cheapest price with SpaceX has to pay $62 million on a Falcon 9 Block 5 rocket. When Block 5 was introduced back in 2018, SpaceX offered a 10% discount for any customer willing to book a flight on a flight-proven booster. This was to give an incentive for a perceived higher risk due to the unknown territory a reused rocket presented to paying customers back then. Today this has changed. Flight-proven rockets have shown to work just as fine when it comes down to Falcon 9. SpaceX has saved loads of money on it too. Three boosters have already flown three times. SpaceX is planning to use one of them up to the fifth time this year. As SpaceX is smart and planning on taking over even more of the global market share, they are now planning to give back some of that saving to their customers. Every Falcon 9 launch from now on will be discounted permanently. The new price tag for Falcon 9 Block 5 across the board is now $50 million. To put this into perspective, Delta IV Heavy, which is comparable to Falcon 9 as it has a similar payload capacity, comes in at $350 million per launch. Thoughts? So Falcon 9 becomes even more attractive than it already is, destined to take even more market share. Starlink failure aid sparks concern about space debris caused by large-scale satellite constellations. I probably don't have to say much about Starlink anymore. SpaceX's large-scale satellite constellation destined to fund SpaceX's way to Mars by providing internet for the world. Recently, SpaceX launched the first large batch of prototype satellites into orbit, bringing us rocket enthusiasts some impressive pictures. SpaceX launched 60 satellites on only one rocket launch, and no, it was not a Falcon Heavy, it was just its little brother, a Falcon 9. 
This is due to the form factor the satellites use. A typical Starlink satellite, as of now, is a microsatellite. It is flat of design and thus stackable in large quantities within the payload fairing of a standard Falcon 9 upper stage. Starlink satellites will be mass produced and mass launched. That's the whole concept. Make it cheap. Now this is where the doubt comes into play. If it's cheap, it doesn't last. Elon launched 60 Starlink satellites into orbit. Of those 60, only 57 are operational. That's three with malfunctions. So that's 95% success rate for a standard Starlink prototype satellite. If we now calculate further, the problem becomes obvious. Starlink, as the informed SpaceX fan knows, will have up to 12,000 satellites in its full stage of expansion. 95% of 12,000 is 11,400. That's 600 microsats not operational floating in space as possibly dangerous debris right after launch. This does not take satellites into account that have hardware failure after launch. Sounds dangerous, right? But this is not the average doom and gloom channel, so let me put it into perspective for you. These Starlink satellites are prototypes. Their hardware exists only for the purpose of testing, and three did not pass the test. SpaceX is gathering data why they did not pass the test and will improve future hardware. Now let's assume that a certain amount of the final satellite hardware will still have failures. Starlink satellites orbit between 550 and later in higher orbits of up to a proposed orbit of 1350 kilometers. These are so-called LEO orbits, meaning they are well within the atmosphere's influence and thus need orbit raising constantly to stay in space. If a satellite says goodbye, it immediately starts losing altitude. At a height of 1350 kilometers, which as stated would be the highest orbit of any Starlink satellite, a malfunctioning microsatellite would stay in orbit for two to five years before burning up in the atmosphere. This is not a fanboy point of view either. These are facts, so it is safe to assume that Starlink satellites will either cause no threat to LEO space or just for a small time until they deorbit even without active propulsion. Did I just destroy a clickbait? That's what happens when you're honest. Not all dangerous sounding headlines are still dangerous after thorough investigation. Now let's leave SpaceX's orbit and enter NASA's realm. NASA impressed with a working in-flight abort test for the Orion capsule. NASA can rejoice as they achieved yet another milestone on the road to the moon for the Artemis program. Orion is NASA's new ride to the moon. With their Artemis program on the move, NASA wants to accomplish again what they did in the 60s and 70s, to return astronauts to the moon. Later, Artemis is even striving to go to Mars. And Orion is going through all the paces needed to be deemed safe and reliable. Where SpaceX's plan to go to the moon and later Mars can be seen as high risk, high reward, NASA's approach is a bit more traditional. Artemis will take time. The moon in 2024, if the budget suggested by Administrator Bridenstine passes and later in the 2030s, Mars. Still, NASA is making good progress on the Orion capsule. On June 2nd at 7 a.m. Eastern Deviation Time, NASA successfully performed Orion's Ascent Abort 2 flight test at Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. It was an in-flight abort test for the Launch Abort System, or LAS. The LAS and the test capsule were launched atop an abort test booster provided by Northrop Grumman. There are two motor systems on the LAS. The abort motors pointing downwards mounted on the side of the tower and the attitude control motors. The abort motors successfully pulled the crew module away from the booster and the ACS reoriented it for safe release. Normally, the capsule would then deploy descent chutes. The test setup did not have those. Instead, it fell back down, jettisoning two data recorders while falling which officially concluded the test. These data recorders hold the precious data collected in flight and were picked up after the test had ended. But what about it? Why do NASA, the Russian Soyuz program and the Chinese Shenzhou program use a launch abort tower system, whereas SpaceX is going for hypergolic liquid-fueled integrated thrusters on the Crew Dragon? It all comes down to reusability. An abort tower system is jettisoned after every flight as it would just be dead weight. This has the benefit of freeing up weight for payload. SpaceX though is very much focused on lowering costs, thus reusing every possible bit of the rocket. Integrated abort thrusters are not jettisoned and are therefore hopefully never used in the first place. So both systems have their advantages. One doesn't lock up so much weight, the other one saves quite a bit of money. 
So the launch tower system fits NASA's strategy better. Use a trusted technology and reach your goal with a steady pace. Two very different strategies, one common goal, the moon. Good luck NASA and Artemis. I can't wait to see SLS take off towards the moon. Now here comes today's sad news. No aliens have been detected on the closest 1300 stars. Now I know, the tinfoil hat faction will mention Roswell and Area 51. That's okay. I want to believe too. The truth is out there. We just have to find it. And there are others who think alike. SETI, for example. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It's a project to be admired and supported. And it goes far back. Even Nikola Tesla suggested in 1896 that an extreme version of his wireless electrical transmission system could in theory be used to contact possible beings on Mars. Today, SETI is a loosely organized group of scientists all following one goal, to find the signal. ET's call from outer space. SETI is not a single organization. Instead, it's just a term for all things related to finding extraterrestrial intelligence. It ranges from radio observation to projects like SETI at home, where anyone can install a software client on their home computer to help scan the huge amounts of data put out by large radio telescopes to find signals that stand out. Amongst those signals are also possible pulsars and other interesting objects emitting strong radio signals. I've used it before and I can only recommend it to calm the inner geek. It's pretty interesting to see the client scan through the data for little dips and beeps possibly sent out by, well, aliens. In 2015, a very special project made big headlines in the space community. Breakthrough Listen. It was announced and strongly supported by the recently deceased Stephen Hawking. One thing separates Breakthrough Listen from any other SETI program done before. It has a meaningful funding. Behind it as a supporter stands the Russian billionaire Yuri Milner. Finally, another billionaire finding good use for all his money. Thank you, Yuri. It is a 10-year initiative and it has $100 million funding. It has been described as the most comprehensive search for alien signals so far. Based at the Berkeley SETI Research Center, resources are being used previously not available to the search for ET. So far so good, right? Now here comes the bad news. There are no signs for E.T., Ewoks or Howard the Duck on any of the 1300 closest stars to Earth. Now there could be many possible explanations for these results. One being there are none, of course. But other possible reasons could be that we simply searched on the wrong frequency bands and that the aliens' cell phone networks just work on a different band. 6G, anyone? Who knows? But what it certainly does mean is that there are no aliens on the closest 1300 stars using anything remotely similar to what we would call a communication device. The search is continuing on the next group of stars already. It's a 10 year project. Six more years to go. The more we search, the higher the chances of success. And of course there are skeptics out there. If we can see them, they can see us. Many, including me, consider finding extraterrestrial life a history-changing moment though. So here's me, desperately hoping for better luck next time. Go Satie! So this again wraps it up for today's episode of What About It? Will SpaceX be able to make the impossible happen on an impossible schedule? How cheap can Falcon 9 get? And did you watch Orion's in-flight abort test? Where are the little green men and when will we find them? As always, tell me in the comments. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in making more and better content. As this gives me more time to focus on what I love doing the most to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Did I just destroy a clickbait? That was... I'm not more. Now this is where the doubt comes into play. If it's cheap, it don't last. It don't last, bro. This has the benefit, benefit. Six more years to go. The higher we search, the lower we get. Uh.